Howdy there folks and welcome into today's video. I have a lot to talk about, a lot to share with you guys in relation to what's going on with the market. Uh, the market's obviously completely turned. How long is that going to last for? Is it a lasting rally? We'll talk about that. What's going on with countless stocks out there, including uh, a few specific stocks I want to speak about in today's video. We got to talk about some things in the economy that are getting obviously far worse, and we're going to speak about that as well. And uh, yeah, so a lot to get into in this video here today. Hope you guys enjoyed as always. I appreciate each and every one of you that subscribed to the channel. Okay, first off here, no bueno. Household debt soars at the fastest pace in 15 years as credit card use surges, says Fed report. Households increase debt at the fastest pace in 15 years due to hefty increase in credit card usage and mortgage balances. The credit card balances collectively rose more than 15% from the same period in 2021, the largest annual jump in more than 20 years, according to the New York Fed. The increase stems from, quote, a combination of robust consumer demand, interesting, and, and higher prices, a Fed official says. Okay, If we look a little deeper here, we're going to see total debt basically jumped $351 billion for the July through September period. Now, keep in mind, we're now in November at this point. If I, I almost guarantee you debts increased uh, pretty rapidly, continuing on here. This is the largest nominal quarterly increase since 2007. Ugh. I mean, it's just not what you want to hear, man. It's just not what you want to hear. Since 2007, we all know what happened right after 2007. Bringing the collective household IOU in the U.S. to a fresh record of $16.5 trillion. That's an increase of 2.2% from the previous quarter of 8.3% from a year ago. The increase follows a $310 billion jump in the second quarter and represents $1.27 trillion annual increase. Debt has surged over the past year due to obviously inflation, running near its highest pace in more than 40 years amid rising interest rates and strong consumer demand. And, you know, when, when you think about this, right, and I think this is extremely important for everybody watching this video um, to understand what's going on here. The Fed is trying their hardest to destroy consumer demand and destroy the economy to get inflation down. That's basically what they're doing, right? But the issue is they're doing this at a time period when debt is obviously at massive records, right? And I, I get a lot of conflicting data out of if the consumer is really that strong or not that strong. Um, I'm kind of erring on the side of not being that strong. And so you're basically watching this kind of play out where, you know, everything looks like it's going to get worse. But jobs are still very plentiful in this economy as of right now. But that, that can definitely shift pretty darn quickly. And we'll go over some of that in this video as well. And so you're in a, a very uh, unfortunate dynamic where the Fed's very hell-bent on destroying things in like, what do you think is going to happen to all this debt? Like, let's just think about this for a moment. What's going to happen to all this debt that's owed when people can't pay that debt, if that's the situation, right? If all of a sudden tons of people are out of work, <gasps> you know, wh and what are the systemic, what are the systemic problems in the banking system? You know, we, we've watched what's obviously played out in, in, in obviously crypto. We've watched what's played out in crypto. We haven't seen anything happen really dramatic in the banking sector. And the reason being is because people still have jobs. If the mass job losses come, that's when you start to figure out if there's systemic problems in the banking system at this point in time, okay? And, you know, the big banks have been uh, fairly quiet uh, in this whole scenario, right? Now, the markets have completely 100% shifted, right? The, the, the Russell's obviously skyrocketing, the NASDAQ skyrocketing, the SP 500 skyrocketing. You look at, you know, pull up a one month, pull up since I did my epic rally video and, you know, the morning, which was October 13th, since that time, all the indexes are up double digit percentages. They've been going beast mode with countless stocks just soaring for the past month or so. You know, another great day out there, except for that one stock at the bottom who apparently doesn't know how to sell a piece of rice cauliflower for a profit. But outside of that, um, green, 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 you know, in my portfolio across the board, it was a lot of, you know, fun out there. And it's been a lot of fun for the last month other than, you know, certain stocks that we won't speak about. Big tech, on my big tech watch list, every single stock was green here today. Every single last one of them, including look at Uberty Booba stock up 8.6% here today. Shopify closing over $40 a share for the first time in quite some time. And that's a stock that's been devastated at the lows. Shopify got all the way down to like $28, $29, right? Right. I mean, just a, office, a massive comeback for countless of these stocks. But do keep in mind, even with this epic comeback, these stocks are still that massive. They're still that epic. NVIDIA's climbed probably 
you know, 50 plus percent in just the past month or month or so. But when it comes to NVIDIA, you, you pull up on one year and you're like, whoa, it's still down huge in, in a year to date. And it's still down huge, uh, regardless of these kind of like comebacks here. Even Chinese stocks are getting in on this rally. Even the Chinese stocks, you look at Baba, Tencent, JD, Neo, all up today with obviously Baba being the biggest. Now, something very important did happen. Okay. And this does matter in a significant way. Basically what happened is Biden and Xi had a meeting, an in-person meeting from my understanding. And that's a huge step in the right direction. Now, no one can get too excited about that. And there might also be some potential bad news when, you know, and I'll share that in just a moment in relation to that. But from the perspective of feeling a little bit better about U.S. and China relations, that's a step in the right direction. Because from my understanding, it's been like three years since there's been an in-person meeting there. And uh, obviously, the relationship, be I mean, U.S. and China used to be very close actually very, very close and about as close as you can possibly get for a, a country that, you know, is, one is obviously communistic and one has a very different view of how the world should be run. They both have very different views. But over the past, I would say five years, the relationship got worse and worse and worse, right? And a meeting like that is at least hope that maybe there's some sort of reconciliation that happened between the sides because at the end of the day, I think the world economy works better. It does. If U.S. and China do get along and when they when U.S. and China don't get along and they're just battling it, it becomes like kind of a tick for tack war where both sides actually end up suffering. And I think that's what both sides are starting to figure out. And I think that's why Biden and Xi had this meeting, because I think they both realized, oh, crap, we're actually, you know, we're, we're, we're in this war in in in. I don't care what war you're talking about, if you're talking about an actual, you know, physical <laughs> altercation war or you're talking about an economic one. Both sides end up getting extremely damaged in that situation. And maybe one does a little better and they technically win, but both sides end up hurt. And I think both countries realize, oh, maybe we should try to work together a little bit or we're going to create potentially a lot more economic destruction than uh, we maybe thought possible by, you know, kind of fighting. And they're, now, at the end of the day, China and the U.S. are the biggest economies out there. And by them not getting along, it just creates a very, uh, let's call it, bad dynamic for global growth. It really does. Plus more worries, right? Housing stocks even got in on the rally today. But the thing with housing stocks, I've been saying this this entire year, you can't trust any rally in these stocks. No way. No way. Not in these stocks. Mm -mm. You know, th those stocks have, uh, in my opinion, at least a year, if not several years of basically being kind of like dead money, if not crashing down. Like best, best case scenario for these stocks for the next, let's call it two to three years is dead money. The more likely probability is probably they're going to go down massively over the next one, two years. Okay. Oil and gas stocks. So oil and gas is interesting. Obviously, Wall Street's been on that kind of bandwagon since around spring, summertime. And, um, you know, obviously oil price has gone down since then. So they, they kind of hopped on at the worst time, right? But they all, they all went up today. But the thing that's interesting about oil, the oil and gas stocks is if China's opening back up for real, and they're going to stay open in 2023. That's obviously a boost for demand of oil products, right? At least in some, some realm of capacity. But at the flip side, if you are of the belief that the worldwide economy, the U.S. economy is going to go into recession, then we're basically going to set up in a situation where oil demand goes down. and goes down substantially in 23 and maybe even into 24. And so if that's a scenario, where do you think the price of oil is going? And we can look back to 2007, 2008, 2009, and we can understand what happens to oil in a recessionary scenario. It doesn't mean it's going to exactly play out that way, but we see what happens here, right? And, you know, you had oil price go insane over the summer, right, to the highest levels we've seen in a long, long time for a commodity that's, at the end of the day, it's kind of a dead commodity. And now at this point, and when I say dead commodity, it's, it's not like... Um, you know, everybody's like bullish on oil for the long term. It's only for the short term. The only thing people think about when it comes to oil and trying to play oil is like the next month or the next year or something like that. No one wants to be in oil for the next 10 years, 20 years. Like, no. Okay. And so we're, we're in a very weird dynamic where you got China opening up. That's going to create demand. But then you got a potential global global recession that could get much much worse in 2023 and that's where you're like okay what, what really happens to demand and you know oil topped out in 07 i think it was oh gosh i think things got up to 140 dollars a barrel at peak and um you know next thing you know gosh where'd oil i think oil bottomed below 40 dollars i want to say a barrel back then it was insane okay 
if you look at ARC, if you look at the ARC, you know, it touched right around $40 here today. And the thing with ARC, I think is important for everybody to understand, is if folks want to play, and when I say folks, I'm really talking about Wall Street. If they want to play the game of, you know, we're going to keep rallying, we're going to, we're going to roar, they're going to play something like an ARC because we know it's going to move huge. And if they're not playing ARC and they really want to play dangerous, they're going to play TARC, which is 2x leverage on the upside of ARC, essentially. And it resets daily. So, you know, I just think at the end of the day, like if Wall Street's looking to play something and they believe the market's going to keep going up, don't be surprised if big inflows happen to, to ARC over the next, uh, let's call it a few weeks, to maybe even over the p- next potential mar- month. No, something I thought was interesting, and this is very, very important and very telling. You, you know why I'm showing you this right now? Because, you know, you had that huge rally in the market today, tons of stocks. But look what Wall Street wasn't buying. Wall Street wasn't buying Wall Street. So that's one of those things that makes you say, okay, is Wall Street really of the belief that the market's coming back and we're going to come back in this situation? Or are they literally only playing this because, you know, we're going to have a year-end rally, Santa Claus rally. They want their year-end bonuses. Um, and it's a situation where they're looking at it and they're like, hey, we're just here to, um, you know, play this in the short term. We have no interest in owning Wall Street because we know, you know, the big banks aren't going to move huge over the next one to two months. That's just not the way it works. But if you're getting into rally mode, you know, it will move huge. Tech stocks, the higher beta plays, like those are those are those are the ones that move, obviously, right? And so, the, you know, the Kathy Wood type type uh, situations, right? And so, I just thought that was very important and kind of telling on, on kind of what's going on in the market out there. Okay, Corsair. So Corsair's had a tremendous kind of comeback here. The stock, so the stock's down twenty four percent year to date, which you know I'll take that. And this year, I'll take twenty four percent down in the year. But it was on a tremendous comeback. And today goes down 9%. And the reason it went down is because they're uh, going to dilute. They're going to uh, do a share offering, right? So one, one side of me, I'm like, okay, that, that's cool. We're going to have a bunch more money around. Awesome. But at the same time, I look at it, and I'm like, the, the stock was just starting to recover and do it pretty strongly. It was on a very nice upward trend there. And on top of that, Corsair's business should get better on every single metric in 2023, uh, you know, I'm talking revenue, I'm talking margins, I'm talking cash flow, everything. Like, I'm of complete belief of that. And, you know, the management team, I think, is actually, you know, at that company, you know, definitely has their heads on straight and knows how to run that business. Andy Paul's been leading that company, gosh, since the 90s. And he's done a heck of a job. And so I look at that, but I was disappointed they did this 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 capital raise because I, I, I honestly don't think the company really needed it. Obviously, in a scary economic environment, in going into potentially a scary recession, if that happens, it is nice to have a bunch more money around, $75 million or whatever, right? But on the flip side, you know, I think they probably could have waited to, to, toward year end or probably first quarter of 2023 to do this capital raise. The stock had momentum. It's probably going to continue to have momentum, but now they just killed all that momentum. And they probably would have been able to raise even more money and dilute even less, if they had just waited till like the first quarter of 2023. Now, Goldman Sachs, from my understanding, was advising them on this. So who knows if they maybe got a little pressure into it because maybe somebody wanted a little uh, bonus bonus before year end or something like that. So I was, I was a little disappointed in that move, to be quite frank. I thought, like I said, I thought they could have got more money and, um, you know, likely diluted less if they had just waited till like the first quarter of 2023. That's just my opinion as a, as a shareholder of that company, okay? Now, the Fed funds rate, we got to talk about this. This is important, okay? Because first off, the Fed funds rate is going to likely go up at least a little bit more. They're going to do some sort of raise in December. We know that. It's just the only question is, is it 50 basis points or 75 basis points? They're going to do some sort of raise. And then potentially a raise in the first quarter. But I definitely think it's very realistic that the Fed's going to stop raising rates in 2023. So that's good news, right, in terms of if you're going to be excited about the market. But. Is a big but. The problem is the Fed funds rate is still going to be very elevated for a while. Okay, it's still going to be very elevated for a while in this situation. So when you, when you think about that, it's not like everything is going to magically fix itself if they're going to leave the Fed funds rate up there. Let's just call it that. And the thing you got to understand is they're not going to bring down the rate. They're not going to bring down the Fed funds rate until the economy just falls off a cliff. When the economy starts to fall off a cliff, unemployment starts rising massively. That's when they start cutting rates, okay? So it's exciting that we're going to get to likely a place 
sooner rather than later where they're going to stop raising rates. But honestly, they're going to probably keep rates relatively high until until the economy starts falling off the wheels. And this is exactly what we saw in the great financial crisis. You know, basically they went on this, you know, epic kind of raise rates, raise rates for several years, right? And then they just kind of flatlined it. And the economy started to, started to um, slow massively, obviously, right? And then things started to fall off a cliff. And what happened is then they stopped, you know, they, they, they started to obviously cut rates left and right. And in July of 2007, Fed funds rate was 5% plus. By December of 08, it was nothing, basically nothing. And then obviously it was there for years and years and years and years. So this is just something important to remember that for much of 23, we could potentially, unless things break really, really quickly in 2023, which I don't think that's going to happen. It's going to be likely be a process that goes throughout the year and kind of just keeps getting, unfortunately, worse uh, from the the economy side. Yeah, you know, that 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 is uh, something important to remember there, okay? Now, in terms of mortgage rates, they have gone down a bit, so that's some good news. But do keep in mind, the 30 years mortgage is still at nearly 7%. Everybody's used to paying, if they're going to get a mortgage, 2 3 4%. So at the end of the day, this is a, it's still an extremely high number. The Fed's still going to have to raise rates at least one more time, if not two more times. You know, worst case scenario, maybe three more times. So the 30-year mortgage, I, I think there's definitely a, a potential that it goes up still quite a bit in, in obviously 2023, which is going to add kind of insult to injury in the housing crisis that we likely have coming in, in, in this situation, right? Plus, obviously, debt's just much more expensive in general, which is going to slow the whole entire construction industry down in a massive way in, in manufacturing as well, which obviously I've stated a few times. Uh, that's going to play out in 2023. So, uh, you know, it's like, okay, we got some improvement, but at the end of the day, it's still insanely high and, and it's still not going to make people say, I got to go buy a new house right now. And you look at the M- Michigan consumer sentiment, you know, they've been doing this for, for, you know, generations. And when you look at this, I mean, you know, recently we've been at pretty much the lowest numbers ever in, in the history of that survey. So, and that's, that's just based upon inflation and kind of the feeling for people out there and if they have confidence in the government and those sorts of things, right? But imagine if the headlines start hitting that, you know, 100,000 people lost jobs. Like we had negative, you know, we basically had unemployment. And, you know, 200,000 jobs we lose or a half million jobs we lose or a million jobs. What's going to happen to consumer sentiment in that situation? Because it's already down so dang low that you, and you think, man, we haven't even seen unemployment rise in any massive way. If, if unemployment just gets worse and worse and worse and that picture gets worse, uh, oh, my gosh. Like, at that point in time, what do we have? And we know we have, a, we, you know, our economy, it's, it's very, very fragile in, in terms of it's a consumer economy. This economy is very reliant on the person going and buying a $5 latte at Starbucks. It's very reliant on, you know, the person going and buying concert tickets. So it's very reliant on these sorts of things, right? And these leisure activities and going to the restaurant and going to the show and doing this and doing that. And, you know, buying a new flat screen TV and buying a new iPad and these sorts of things. And so, you know, that's what our economy is very based upon in the United States. And if consumers aren't feeling good, obviously, the, the worse they feel, the more likely you'll see start to see spending dry up more and more and more as, as kind of time ticks on in, in that whole situation, right? Now, in terms of how long this rally could last for, right, I will tell you this. This rally will last for as long as Wall Street wants it to last for. The truth is, 2022 has been the year where Wall Street took this market back and said, retail, you guys are a bunch of jokers. We got, you'll find out who the real captain is. And whenever they want to tank the market, they'll tank it. They'll sell off in mass. But at the end of the day, if they want to skyrocket this baby into year end, get on for the roller coaster ride because they will do just that. It, they are in full control of this show, 100%. And then they can worry about, you know, potentially crashing it back down in the first quarter, second quarter of uh, 2023, if that's what they want to do. But this show is ran by Wall Street. And if they want to, if they want to skyrocket this baby and have everything go up massively for the next few months into year end and collect big, huge bonuses, they're going to do exactly that. And we're just along for the ride in this situation. Hope you guys enjoyed this video as always. Also, if you didn't get to see this video, I put on the, the my new channel, the reaction channel, check this one out because uh, retail 
definitely uh, looks like they shorted the market heavy. And I, I reacted to a few videos on that channel that were, I think were pretty important. So you guys would definitely want to check out that. Also, massive sale coming up in uh, on Black Friday for joining the private stock group, private Discord chat, everything like that. If you ever wanted to get the access to that and all my course curriculums, things like that, check out the pinned comment down there. Much love as always and have a great day.